Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the November 17th, 2023 California Board of Accountancy meeting. My name is Katrina Salazar. I am your current CBA president, and uh, I am excited to resume our uh, agenda today. There are a few reminders for everyone. When you speak, please be sure your microphone is on by holding the button. You'll see a green light. Please pull it towards you and speak, excuse me, slowly and clearly into the microphone. Um, as a reminder, the board has provided an opportunity for the public to participate via our WebEx platform. When we do take public comments, we will start with taking public comment in our Sacramento location and will then um, request comment from individuals uh, online using the moderator. Uh, speakers for public comment will be allotted up to five minutes each. And with that, I believe that covers our welcome introductions. I would like to turn this uh, over to Ms. Rebecca Reed to call roll so that we can establish a quorum. Patricia Batchelor. Here. Nancy Corrigan. Nancy Corrigan present. <coughs> Christian Lada. To Tony Lynn. Here. Joe Rosenbaum. Here. Katrina Salazar. Present. Teresa Thompson. Present. Yen Tu. Here. And Evangeline Ward. I'm present. We have a quorum. Thank you very much for that. So um, we will begin our agenda with item 4C. That's under the report of our Secretary Treasurer, uh, Member Rosenbaum. Um, but the presentation will be coming from Deanne Pierce. So I would like to begin with item 4C, the discussion and possible discussion and possible action regarding the assessment of credit card processing fees. Ms. Pierce. Thank you and good morning. Um, so the purpose of this agenda item is to provide the CBA with information on present and future processing fees associated with online credit card transactions. To provide a little background, the CBA and other boards and bureaus within the Department of Consumer Affairs must contract with a payment processing vendor in order to accept online credit card payments for fees. For each credit card payment process, a transaction fee of 2.3% is assessed by the vendor. Some boards or bureaus pay the transaction fee while others pass the fee on to their users, which is referred to as the service fee model. The CBA first started accepting credit card payments for license renewal back in December 2018. At that time, the CBA decided to pay the processing fee to maximize usage. In 2019, the CBA discussed expanding the credit card payment option to other fee types and the assessment of associated processing fee. Direction was provided to do some additional research on other boards and bureaus and the assessment of fees and to bring this issue back following the outcome of the fee analysis or fee changes. In 2021, the CBA launched an online application for CPA licensure, including a credit card payment option for the CPA, li CPA licensure application and initial licensure fees, and the CBA is paying the associated processing fees with those as well. As members may be aware, the CBA achieved a statutory fee increase for its license renewal and initial licensure fees, which will be rolled out in two phases on July 1, 2024 and July 1, 2026. Because the credit card processing fee is 2.3% of the transaction amount, the fee increases will have a direct impact on what the CBA is paying for each transaction. Last fiscal year, the CBA paid approximately 251,000 in processing fees. It's anticipated that the cost will increase slightly this year based on the inclusion of account accountancy firm renewals to the online platform. The bigger increase in processing fees will start next fiscal year, 2425, where processing fees could be close to 400,000. When phase two of the license renewal and initial licensure fee increases take effect in fiscal year 2627, the cost will increase again. If the CBA were to pass the present 2.3% processing fee to the user, also referred to as the service fee, the estimated cost passed to the user is identified on page, uh, at the top of page four of the paper. 
Another consideration is that the CBA is in the early stages of a project that would allow applicants applying for the uniform CPA examination the ability to pay via a credit card. Presently, individuals can submit an application online for the CPA exam, but must print out and submit a remittance form with a check, money order, or cashier's check. The addition of the online credit card payment option for examination applicants will create an additional annual cost for credit card processing fees of approximately $28,000. If the fee was passed on to the user, the individual service fees are identified on the top of page five. The question to the board is whether the CBA should, uh, would like to continue paying the credit card processing fees or pass the cost to the individual user. Staff does not have a recommendation. However, if the CBA decides to transition the cost to the individual user, the service fee model, we would suggest a July 1, 2024 effective date to handle outreach and logistics. I'll now turn it back to President Salazar and I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you for that, Ms. Pierce. Questions from our board members? Ms. Tu? Can, um, Ms. Pierce, do you, when we were calculating the increase in fees, did we take into consideration of this 2.3% service charge? Um, may I respond? Yeah. Okay. Uh, as part of the fee analysis part, um, we did not. The fee analysis focused on staff processing, you know, with the, the cost of service that the staff were producing, so it was focused on that. Ms. Corrigan. Thank you, President Salazar. Um, thank you for that information, Ms. Pierce. And, and I noted in reviewing materials that this was a budget augmentation item. And um, well, and I might say, first of all, I was really shocked at how much these fees can accumulate to because uh, yeah. it's kind of you're looking at a per person or per right. candidate it's kind of and then you put them all together and it's like wow massive um but i noted the budget augmentation and um uh, if we were not to approve it that augmentation i guess would go away would be taken away um which is a thought something to consider and is that something that we anticipate ongoing year by year by year are we is it an un, is that not safe to do thank you the are you referring to the augmentation yeah um we actually went in for a budget change proposal to get a budget augmentation um i back i think it was shortly after we actually took on online credit card payments to kind of cover that processing fee and since that time dca has actually um, kind of done the heavy lifting for us on that part and then each year asked if we wanted an additional augmentation to cover the increase in uh, credit card processing fees so that's kind of something that dca has kind of taken the lead on because multiple boards are actually in the same boat. Um, so they would probably likely continue to do that for us. If we decide to um, not cover the transaction fee, then they would likely not obviously get an augmentation for us. And then we may have to look at what's called a reverse BCP, which is basically to kind of give back the money in our budget that was set aside for credit card processing fees. Thank you. Right, additional questions? Mr. Rosenbaum? Is there, well, has there been any analysis done um, with respect to how much uh, savings would occur by not having to process checks and um, forms manually? Right now, I, I, I guess maybe I need a little bit of clarification on that. So it, right it, now- It's okay, I, uh, more, I guess it was more, maybe rhetorical, just pointing out that there are gonna be some efficiencies by accepting credit cards Absolutely. for all of these things. Um, and so I know from personal experience, if I have a choice between having to pay a service fee or mailing the check, I'm usually pretty stubborn and say, I'm gonna go ahead and just mail the check yeah. just because. Uh, so I would, I, would, um, I would take that into consideration as well. The, if I may respond, President Salva. Please respond freely throughout the okay. presentation. Thank you. Um, there have been a, a, 
many efficiencies. You're absolutely 100% correct, especially, you know, when we launched this with online license renewal and we've, um, you know, transitioned to the CBA Connect, the online platform for license renewal and credit card payment and similar application processes for CPA licensure. And so there's definitely efficiencies in that respect. Also meeting stakeholder demand is really kind of the other part of it. When we were just doing, you know, checks, money order cashier checks, um, a lot of a lot of feedback came from our stakeholder survey was, you know, when are you going to start accepting credit card payments, you know, and so we actually got a lot of feedback on that. So I definitely think it's um, definitely beneficial on the processing side and B, we're meeting stakeholder demand. Stu? Thank you. Thank you. President Salazar. Um, I, I happen to have been in a hotel lobby, ran into somebody and find out he's a CPA. And so we had a little bit of a discussion. I mentioned this item on the agenda to him. And he said, oh, my God, that will be lovely to have every, all the fees uh, 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 by credit card if we can do that. And then um, I also just kind of uh, anecdotally talked to him a little bit about the uh, EC, the um, continual education process that is digitized now, and he's just like loving that. And so uh, just all these improvement in processing, processing, I think for the licensors, they are all very grateful for it. So I'm, I'm inclined to not add the service fee to myself. Ward, excuse me. <clears throat> I think, well, I don't know what the options are, but I think that if we have the credit card fee, credit card service available, it's needed for people who would like to just process it. I will pay a service fee before I have to go get a cashier's check or make a drive in person to pay something. I have no problem with that. My mom wants to send a check. To me, a check is very scary. Your whole account's on the bottom of that piece of paper. Um, I've heard many students for hygiene apply. They haven't cashed my check. They haven't cashed my check. And then they're scared. And the phone calls are going crazy to the board. So I'm not sure if you received a lot of phone calls. My check's not cashed yet. So the process of that, the headache of like, well, you sent your check. You have to wait until we every Friday. We I don't know what happens. But so I, I think I think there's no problem at all for the amount you said the board has to cover compared to the less than $10 looking at 2026 that they would have to pay for a credit card transaction. They pay it to PG&E. They pay it to whatever big businesses we have to pay bills to. The credit card fee we pay to your credit card interest rates. So this is the part of life. Taxes on groceries. I'm just saying I can go down a long list what we have to do. I will just say on the check part, just we have a requirement to deposit checks within five days. So we, um, that's our goal. So um, hopefully that comment from our applicants is minimized, but definitely there is some anxiety when you send a check off and you're kind of waiting. So I understand that. And thank you for clarifying uh, our processes, Ms. Beers. Mr. Rosenbaum. I'd like to make motion that we go ahead with uh, uh, the credit card processing and do not uh, charge our stakeholders, but rather absorb the cost. So, yeah, that's status quo. So we actually don't, do we, I mean, we we don't require a motion because there's no change. So, okay. Um, so, yeah, so I think, so I think my recommendation would be, if I may, may, may comment here, I'm gonna call myself Katrina. What would you think? Um, uh, I would suggest maybe that this be uh, put on a future agenda to periodically be revisited to ensure that it's financially prudent to continue our process of absorbing credit card fees. But we aren't asking for, as a group, the consensus is no action is needed today regarding our change. We can just status quo, continue what we're doing. Mr. Lin? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm for the... Um, the end user to pay for the fees. But for today's, um, in my experience, uh, all the county, city, state, whatever payment I make, I pay the fee. 
accept the e check, we don't have to pay the fee. I'm okay with it. Mm -hmm. And plus, it's a big saving for the state. And uh, I'm for the the end user to pay for the fee. I don't see any problem with it. You know, thank you. Thank you for that. Do you have, I mean, the one thing I would say is remember, our fees are increasing as well. So we are adding a credit card burden to our licensees. At the same time, we're also would be rolling out uh, increased costs for them. So that is uh, a, just the environment. So um, I will call on Ms. Ward. So you, we don't have a motion and we would require a motion to, that's a different action. Um, and so I will open it up if there is a motion, we will take mm -hmm. a vote on whether or not to increase fees. Ms. Ward. Well, I would like to make a motion to have the service fee placed on the applicant, no, I'm sorry, not applicant, but the, well, I guess it's the applicant, renewal. The payer. The payer. Have the service fee transferred to the payer moving forward. So we have a motion um, for CBA to have the payer absorb the credit card fees and pay for it. Um, we need a second on a motion in order to discuss or vote. So without a second, the motion dies and we remain with the status quo. Okay. Okay. So okay. Well, may I just add, some of the board think about, you said $400,000, how much you say? Starting in July and uh, next fiscal year, we're looking at about $400,000. $400,000 to pay, although it is something great for the person who's applying for their license renewal. But think about the money you can use for different things to help the board. You talked about helping students. So, and we're moving into discussion, sorry, yes, which yes, technically yes. we I'm can't sorry. do. Right. So we have a first. Yes. We, I will make one more appeal. Do we have a second? Okay. Ms. Lata? I second. Okay. So we have a first, a second. Did you have any additional statements regarding the motion? Well, just to point out again, the amount that we're looking at is $10 in 2026. At the hotel, my coffee was $5, I'm just saying. How often do we renew your license? It's not that much of a burden. That's what I believe. We want to reach out to more of the colleges, have the schools come in. I am trying to have DVC come in. We won't fit. So if we can actually get schools to come and students participate to make the, the board grow, we're going to have, I think we're talking about moving to another place, but not. I'm just thinking of the money where it can go, something better instead of paying $10 for every person. That's all. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lynn, and then Ms. Lata. Yeah. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Um, do we also uh, provide the e-check payment if we we, um, we provide them the online credit card payment? Do we uh, offer them the e-check payment? So uh, to my experience, e-check payment will be f for free. We don't offer the e-check payment right now. That's something that the Department of Consumer Affairs is in the early stages of exploring. So that's something that could be done at a future time, but it would be separate from this contract that we have with the credit card processing company. Thank you for clarifying that. Ms. Lata? Uh, Mr. Lynn asked my question. I was, con I was curious if that was an option. Well, thank you. So I think with that, I'd like to call for the vote. So Ms. Reed? Oh wait, yes, thank you. We do need public comment. So I'd like to invite public comment here in Sacramento. And seeing none, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator, please open up the online portal for public comment. And we are on agenda item 4C, discussion and possible action regarding the assessment of credit card processing fees. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please close public comments online. All right, now with that, Ms. Reed, please call for the vote. Okay, Evangeline Ward? Yes. Yen Tu? No. Teresa Thompson? No. Katrina Salazar? No. Joe Rosenbaum? No. Tony Lynn? No. Christian Lada? No. 
And Nancy Corrigan? No. And Patricia Batchelor? No. And the motion fails. Okay. Thank you. Um, and moving along to the next agenda item, we will move along to item nine, which is the report of the executive officer. And the first item A is the update regarding strategic planning activities. So I would uh, like to invite Ms. Pierce to continue presenting. Thank you. So the purpose of this agenda item is to provide the CBA with an update on activities occurring to accomplish the various objectives contained in the 2022-2024 strategic plan, which is attachment two to your agenda item. Um, but if you refer to attachment one, we have taken all the objectives that the CBA developed to accomplish the goals in the strategic plan and identify the actions taken to achieve the goal. We have completed six objectives and the remaining um, are identified as in process. So we are still working on completing the objectives or it could be that the objectives are ongoing and may carry over to the next strategic plan. So I'm happy to answer any questions that members have on any of the objectives that we have in the attachment and I will turn it back over to the president. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions? Okay, seeing none. So what I will do is I will um, open up this entire topic for one public comment at the end. So that will be items 9A through 9D. So seeing no comments or questions from the board, thank you very much, Ms. Pierce. And we move along to 9B, which is a report of the administration division. So I would like to welcome our manager of administrative services to present. Good morning. Good morning, uh, President Salazar, member of the board, all members of the board. My name is Christy Abate. I am the CBA administrative services manager, and I will be presenting the administration activity report. Uh, it is once a time again to submit the California Department of Finances State Leadership Accountability Act, Accountability Act, excuse me, also known as the SLAY report. Um, this is a biennial reporting that's required from all state agencies. Um, we usually report on our adequacy, adequacy of our internal control systems. Um, once approved by the Department of Consumer Affairs the business and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency, it will be sent and published by the Department of Finance on their website, as well as posted to the CBA website. Um, moving on, staff are beginning in the beginning plans um, of the CBA strategic plan. As we head into the final year of the current plan in 2024, a meeting with CBA leadership leadership will happen early next year that will officially kick off the process. And exciting news, the last enhancement from our business modernization project uh, when it rolled out last evening. Um, this is to add the capability to renew retired status through the CBA Connect. The next phase of this rollout will be the addition of accountancy firms and um, accountancy firms to the platform, which is currently in the development stages. This concludes my presentation on the agenda item. I'll now turn it back over to President Salazar, but I am also happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, well, thank you for that update. Very timely, something rolled out last night. That's amazing. <laughs> so um, thank you for um, getting that completed in order to make that announcement here. Questions or comments from our board members? All right, seeing none, thank you so very much for that report. Thanks. All right, so our next item is 9C, which is a presentation of the California Board of Accountancy annual report. So I would like to invite our information and planning officer to present. Thank you, President Salazar. Good morning, members of the board. I am David Hemphill, the information and planning officer. The CBA, I am pleased to present the California Board of Accountancy's fiscal year 2022-23 annual report. The annual report discusses the accomplishments of the CBA during the prior fiscal year starting July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023, specifically the work achieved in fulfilling the directives and policy objectives set by the CBA as we fulfill our mission to protect consumers. The report is made available to key stakeholders and will be published on the CBA website following approval by the board and incorporation of any edits the members may have. 
The report is broken down into several sections. I'd like to briefly discuss some of last year's fiscal highlights. For communications and outreach, the CBA launched a redesigned website in the fall of 2022, giving a fresh look and easier navigation for stakeholders visiting the site. The CBA's college and university outreach returned to in-person with two events on campus during 2022-23, but we also hosted a virtual webinar geared toward licensees titled The Future of the Accounting Profession that was attended by almost 500 individuals. CBA social media pages grew to over 12,000 followers during the last fiscal year, with staff creating and using more graphics to accompany many posts, which is known to increase views and interaction. In enforcement, the CBA received 4,584 complaints and closed 5,043 investigations. Nearly 75% were closed within six months from the initial complaint investigation date, and 99% were closed within one year. Our licensing division successfully maintained examination and licensure processing timeframes below the 30-day goal. The annual report details the findings and recommendations of the consideration of the CPA Experience Requirements Task Force, which concluded its work during the last fiscal year. It also discusses the students understanding the requirements to be a CPA project, the multi-year project which began in the spring that is studying ways to potentially clarify the educational requirements for licensure and how the CBA presents them. Staff continues to work on the business modernization project to achieve its goal of creating a more efficient licensing, renewal, and enforcement process for all stakeholders. CBA Connect, the online license renewal platform, underwent a series of enhancements in the last fiscal year, many coming from suggestions to our CBA Connect survey, which licensees are promoted to take after completing their renewal. Business modernization will continue to be a priority in the coming years. The annual report concludes with a focus on the CBA network migration, which was a large scale IT project to merge all CBA IT systems and networks into DCA's IT infrastructure. I would like to note that if any members have edits or corrections to the report, please let me know and we can incorporate those into the final prior to posting on the website. That concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions the members may have. Okay, thank you. Questions? Ms. Chu? Thank you, Person Sells. Uh, th thank you for this uh, lovely annual report. I notice it's still draft. Is there going to be in time to incorporate our new board members on the uh, pictures of the board members? Well, I do believe since it ended, it's just the fiscal year of the last year. So it, but they are, right? I won't speak to that, but I believe that's appropriate, right, Ms. Pierce? I didn't hear that last part. I'm sorry, Ms. Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just saying I, I don't think it's appropriate to include them since it concludes on it's June a, 30th. Yeah, it ended it's June 30th, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, my only question, is there a particular deadline by the end of this week you would like any non-substantive uh, comments from board members? Is there a deadline Let's for say uh, November 30th, which would be consistent with what yep. uh, Ms. Pierce had for the Sunset Review Report. So I Thank think you very great. much. Yeah. All right. So we do uh, need some quick comments if there will be any non-substantive changes. Excellent. And at your um, ready, please proceed. I believe you have one more report. I do. Uh, let's jump into the Communications and Outreach Report. Uh, it certainly has been a busy fall for the communications and outreach team, so I'll try to touch on uh, quite a few activities as quickly as I can. Back in September, the CBA participated in the Fort Irwin Army Base Education Credentialing and Resource Fair. I'd like to extend our gratitude to Special Project Manager Suzanne Gracia for representing the CBA there. Just last week, President Salazar and Secretary Treasurer Rosenbaum participated in two separate virtual events. On November 7th, President Salazar provided updates on CBA activities and initiatives at Cal CPA's Elite Access Series. Then on the 9th, for the second time this year, Mr. Rosenbaum presented at a meeting of the American Academy of Attorney CPAs. He discussed his career as a forensic accountant and the opportunities available in this exciting field. The CBA would like to thank both of them for their unwavering support in our outreach activities. Looking ahead to December, the CBA is excited to be partnering with California State University Sacramento for the final outreach event of the year. 
Initial Licensing Unit Manager Jennifer Huddy will join me in interacting with smaller groups of students in a roundtable format. There will also be local CPAs from different areas of the profession having their own tables. The students will go from table to table, changing every 10 minutes, similar to a speed dating format. So we're <laughs> excited about the opportunity to speak to uh, more personally to some of the students about the requirements to be approved for examination and licensure and answer whatever questions they may have. While this is going on, there will be additional CBA staff reviewing students' transcripts. So we look forward to the event and especially interested in how all the rotations will play out. We might use that in the future. I've mentioned previously how we're intending to ramp up our multimedia content, and we're starting to see this come to fruition. Three videos and a podcast episode were produced since the last CBA meeting, uh, and one more video is just about complete. I would like to show two of the videos to you today, which fall on opposite sides of the spectrum. One is a more traditional instructional style video, while the other is lighthearted and kind of novelty. Both are successful in conveying their messages, even though they're done in very different ways. So the first video is on the topic of CPA evolution. With so many details involved in the changing of the CPA exam, it really does a good job of simplifying everything and using graphics to explain the transition. So let's take a look. And go. <laughs> it's coming. Do we have, I know. Do we think Amir? I think Amir's running. Well, I can reenact it. While we're like, waiting. Actually, okay, may I comment while we're waiting? Um, so the outreach activities are really for all board members. So we have a fantastic team. We have a lot of opportunities. So as we're waiting for this to queue up, really, it, you know, don't, if you're a board member and you have an interest in outreach, don't wait to be called. Let um, Mr. Hemphill know and they will help facilitate that connection. We're not hearing the audio here in the room. Um, one second. Um, for my co-host, if you go to share, um, when you go to share, um, you'll want to click. Um, there's a button that says um, optimize for motion and video. That'll let your um, computer audio um, sync up with the WebEx. <laughs> So try like not sharing and then sharing again with that optimized for video and motion. I'll just mention, I'll, I'll move ahead and uh, talk about a couple of the other videos while they're getting that ready. So one of the other videos we completed recently was uh, kind of a fancy recap of the September CBA meeting and outreach events that were held on campus at California State Polytechnic University Pomona using actual video footage and photos to showcase what happened over those two days and the benefit to students and faculty of having the CBA at their school. And then the video, which is in the final editing stages right now, tells the story of the CBA and its structure and features many current staff members explaining why they love working at the CBA. We're going to use this video as we seek to recruit talented individuals to apply for job openings at the CBA. So a big thank you to all of our incredible staff who helped contribute to that production. A new episode of the Accounting for California podcast posted in late October, featuring examination unit manager Eulalio Ortega, explaining in depth the many aspects of CPA evolution. So we're just using every possible avenue to get the word out about the changes coming to the CPA exam. All right, let's see what we're... Big changes are coming to the CPA exam in 2024 with the launch of CPA Evolution. What is CPA Evolution, you ask? 
Well, the CPA licensure model is transforming to recognize the rapidly changing skills the practice of accounting requires today. Okay, well, we heard the audio, now we need the video to go with the audio. Exactly, we've gotten one of each. <laughs> I know we can do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll move on. Okay. It's a good video. Thank you. We will we will look forward to those links. Yeah, I will. If board members don't mind, I will send you both of the links yourself. The other one was a a Halloween themed video filmed in front of a green screen, which was very interesting and funny. So you will want to see that. All right. Well, let's move on to our celebratory update 100 newsletter. We're all very excited about. It'll be published uh, probably early December, probably about a couple of weeks away. The issue has all the usual information about recent CDA activities. But we've also uh, used the milestone opportunity to include a bunch of fun and retrospective elements as well that'll take us on a trip back in time to 1901 when the State Board of Accountancy began and 1986 when the first issue of Update was published. We included some information found in what I believe to be the oldest document in the CDA's possession, which is this bound volume of meeting minutes and others dated 1906 to 1913. So this is gold right here. One of the pages featured is the board's expense report from 1908, which included railroad fare for one of the members to travel to Los Angeles to administer whatever the CPA exam was back then, and rent for the CDA office. Any guesses on how much we paid monthly for rent in 1908? Give me a guess, $20. Lower, lower. Five dollars. Wow. Five dollars a month. And that was in San Francisco. So impressive how times have changed. <laughs> yeah, 60 bucks and we're clear for the year. 1908 is the earliest one I found in there. Because in 1906, all the documents were destroyed in the in the San Francisco in earthquake and fire, if you know your CBA history. So the CBA paid five dollars right, per issue. month. All right, the issue features an inspiring interview also with President Salazar, first published in Cal CPA Magazine, where she shares her perspective on why diversity in the profession is important and essential to keep the pipeline flowing. The interview aligns with the CBA's goal of promoting DE&I within the accounting profession. All right, CBA social media presence has gotten a boost with the implementation of our structured calendar content for posting. It has led to more engagement across all platforms with October actually realizing the highest non-COVID single month increase of followers in the last four years since we've been tracking this data. We're also on track to reach 13,000 combined followers on all social platforms by the end of the year. And if that wasn't enough, I'm excited to share the CBA has added Instagram to our social platform. Uh, if you're on Instagram, please be sure to follow our new account, underscore CBA news. There we go. So we have eight followers right now because we just created it a few days ago. So you can be in on the ground floor. We look forward to sharing the CBA story and providing important updates for consumers in Instagram's unique style. All right, that concludes my presentation on this agenda item. Sorry, we didn't get to see the videos, but I will now turn it back to President Salazar, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you for sharing that information. Questions from our board members. No, thank you very much for all of this hard work. Um, so I would like to open up items 9A through 9D for public comment here in Sacramento. And we do have public comment. Please introduce yourself. Uh, Jason Fox of the California Society of CPAs. I just want to acknowledge the staff. Um, I've been coming to board meetings for a very long time. Um, and I've seen a marketed improvement in the outreach and education and the creative aspect of it too. And I think that's been very helpful for licenses and candidates, so I just want to acknowledge the, the staff's work on that. It's been very impactful for licensees. Thank you. 
Thank you for sharing that. I, uh, I I think that is fantastic to put on the record, and and I know as a board member, I certainly appreciate um, what is happening in these areas, um, and it's exciting. Can't wait to see those videos. Um, I would like to now invite our WebEx moderator to open up for online comments for an item for items nine A through D. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q and a feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q and a icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen and or use the raise hand function and audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Thank you, moderator. Yes, please close the Q&A panel. And that concludes item 9. We are now moving on in our agenda to item 11, which is our report of the enforcement chief. So I'd like to invite our deputy chief from the enforcement division to make a presentation. Good morning. I'm Carrie O'Connor and I am the Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Division. And the activity report before you today is for the first quarter of fiscal year 2023-24. The CBA received nearly 1,800 complaints. The graph on the bottom of page one provides a comparison of the total number of complaints received as of the same reporting period for the prior two fiscal years. Members will see that compared with the prior two fiscal years, we have received an in increase um, with the most recent fiscal year being compared a 63% increase. On page two, we have included information on the top three complaint types with complaints regarding unlicensed activity being the top complaint. Moving on to investigations and investigations pending on page three. At the end of the first quarter of the fiscal year, staff closed 1,831 cases, with 94% of those cases being closed within one year. The average days to close investigations was 105 days, which is a slight decrease since the last report. And enforcement had just short of 1,900 cases in its pending investigations inventory. Members will see an increase of pending cases in the six to 12 months bracket compared to fiscal year 22-23. Um, this is due largely to the influx in the number of unlicensed complaints received. And I would like to highlight that staff have focused on complaints in the six to 12 months and 12 to 24 month range. And since the data was run for this report, we have closed 198 cases in the six to 12 month um, category and 36 cases in the 12 to 24 month category. There were three cases over 24 months, um, which are still actively being investigated. Members will see that the average day of our open cases is at 105 days. And now moving on to discipline related information, which is on page four of the report. Looking first at AG referrals, the CBA referred five matters to the AG and filed seven pleadings with majority being accusations. The CBA had 24 matters pending at the AG's office. And lastly, in this section, the CBA has taken action on 11 final disciplinary orders. Moving on to citations on page five, the CBA issued 285 citations. 80% of the citations were for the 20 and 12 continuing education requirement, and the CBA received 29 citation and fine appeals. We have withdrawn or modified 14 citations based on those appeals, and in most cases, the licensee either provided new mitigating evidence or complied with the issue that resulted um, in the issuance of the citation. Page six contains information regarding unlicensed activity. The CBA had received 866 complaints regarding unlicensed activity, and we have closed 810 investigations through the first quarter of the fiscal year, with the majority of those cases being closed as a result of compliance. The final area of the report I'd like to highlight is page seven 
uh, which is probation monitoring. Um, I'd like to note there was a technical glitch with the information that was uploaded to this section on the website. It has been corrected, um, but if you downloaded the information a couple of days ago, it may not have been on there. So I'll go over some of those statistics. Um, as of September 30th, we had 76 licensees on probation uh, with two new probationers since the last um, enforcement activity report um, and two probation orientations being completed for those probationers. We identified eight probation violations with the majority being failure to submit the written quarterly report. At this time, I'd like to turn the discussion on this item over to President Salazar and be happy to answer any questions members may have. Great. Thank you. Any questions from the board members? All right, seeing none, what I would like to do is I would like to call for our next report and then I will open up for public comments on items 11 and 12 at the same time. So stay close just in case, thank you. So um, moving along to our report of the licensing chief, I'd like to invite um, Ms. Center to, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. It is the licensing unit report, but we are inviting uh, our manager of the licensing unit, uh, Ms. Huddy. So sorry for that confusion. Welcome and please present when you are ready. Thank you, President Salazar. My name is Jennifer Huddy and I'm the manager of the initial licensing unit. The licensing activity report or LAR covers July 1st, 2023 through September 30th, 2023. The LAR begins with the reporting of processing times. I'm pleased to report that the processing times are below 30 days and have been after having been above 30 days for a short period of time. Now, if you turn your attention to page two of the LAR, you'll see that there were over 33,900 stakeholder inquiries in the form of emails and telephone calls. This is inclusive of CBA calls directed to the DCA call center. On to pages three and four. As of September 30th, the examinations unit has approved 2,073 first-time applicants to sit for the CPA exam. The initial licensing unit has approved over 690, excuse me, 690 applications for CPAs and firms. On pages five through seven, data related to renewal statistics, renewal deficiencies and continuing education audits are displayed. Table seven includes CE audit data. 225 licensees were selected so far for an audit in fiscal year 23-24, and of those, 111 have been found to be compliant. 100 are still in process. Table eight includes population data. As of September 30th, the CBA had a grand total of 114,856 licensees and registrations. This is a slight decline since June 30th, 2023. That concludes my presentation and I'll now turn it back over to President Salazar. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Huddy. Do we have questions on the licensing activity report from our board members? Okay, seeing no questions, I'd like to invite you to continue. Thank you, President Salazar. So I'm moving on to the report on the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants 2023 Trends Report. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide the CBA with a summary of the AICPA's 2023, 2023 Trends Report that may be useful when considering the pipeline of future California CPAs. At its September 2023 meeting, staff presented an item on licensing data trends However, the 2023 AICPA Trends Report had not yet been released and was not included in the September item. The, AIC, the AICPA reported the following national pipeline related trends in their 2023 report. Accounting graduates trended downward in the 2021 through 22 academic year with decreases of 7.8% and 6.4% at the bachelor's and master's levels respectively. Of firms that hired one or more accounting graduates in 2021, 91% expected to hire the same number or more in 2023 as compared with 2022. 60% of all US CPA firms expect to have the same number or more CPAs on staff in 2023 in comparison with 2022. 
The number of CPA exam candidates in 2023 increased compared to 2022. This may be due to the upcoming launch of the new CPA exam in January 2024. 2022 saw the lowest number of new CPA exams, exam candidates compared to the last, excuse me, compared to the prior 16 years. And that concludes my presentation. I'll turn it back over to President Salazar and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for sharing that report. Questions from our board members on the trends report. Okay. So seeing no questions, I would like to open up for public comment here in Sacramento for items 11 and 12. So that's our enforcement activity report, our licensing activity report, and the AICPA's trends report. So seeing no public comment here in Sacramento, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up for online comment for items 11 and 12. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit the requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Yes, moderator, please close the online Q&A and thank you, uh, Ms. Huddy, for that presentation. Moving along in our agenda item it brings us to item number 13, which are the meeting minutes. That is the approval needed. Uh, and so I would like to ask for a motion to adopt the minutes of the September 21st, 22nd, 2023 Board of Accountancy meeting. So it's specifically agenda item 13A, which includes non substantive edits noted after the materials were received. I'm looking for a first. Ms. Ward. I'd like to make a motion to accept the meeting minute, meeting, meeting minutes from September 21, 22, 2023 board meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Corrigan. And I will second that motion. Thank you. Fantastic. Board member comments. Seeing none public comment here in Sacramento. Seeing none, I'd like to invite the WebEx moderator to please open up agenda item 13A for public comment. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All yeah. right, and seeing, oh. Oh. <laughs> seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. All right. All right, thank you very much. With that, I'd like to invite Ms. Reed to please call for the vote. Nancy Corrigan. Yes. Christian Lauda. Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Abstain. Ian Tu? Abstain. Evangeline Ward? Yes. And Patricia Batchelor? Abstain. And the motion carries. All right, thank you for that. Um, next, I would like to request a motion to accept the remaining minutes, which are agenda items 13B through 13E, which include non-substantive edits noted after the materials were received. Ms. Ward? I'd like to make a motion to accept the remaining minutes from, um, do I need to read all of them now or just say the remaining? Just. 13B through 13E. Okay, so two step uh, minute meetings from 13B, C, D, and E. Thank you very much for that motion. I'm looking for a second. Ms. Corrigan? I would uh, second that motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Board comments? 
seeing none, I'd like to invite public comment here in Sacramento. And seeing none, I would like to invite the WebEx moderator for public comment on agenda items 13B through 13E. This is the moderator, not the direction of the board. I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio-only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you, moderator. Now I'd like to invite Ms. Reed to call for the vote. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Abstain. Yin Tu? Yes. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Abstain. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Christian Lada? Abstain. And Tony Lynn? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you very much for that. Moving along in our agenda, we are now at other business. And so we have a, a fairly large assortment of items here. So I would like to um, take a little bit of presidential prerogative. I will um, comment on my agenda item, which is 14A1A. And then I will invite Ms. Corrigan to speak to some of the other items in the agenda. So under the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, I will keep my report on items uh, 1A for the Board of Examiners, very brief. Um, I will share there have been a couple meetings. Uh, they were related to understanding the process regarding um, scoring under CPA evolution. Uh, in addition, another meeting uh, was uh, specific to following up on trends and the finances related to the exam. And I think although there is a, a lot of content to cover, what, what I thought was interesting to share is that um, in the BOE report, uh, the AICPA is seeing an increase in candidates rushing in. We heard that to sit for the exam that's consistent with what we've heard previously in this meeting in terms of our own candidates within our state. But nationally, they are seeing an increase. This is uh, not unexpected and is relatively typical when there is a change in an exam, such as we will be experiencing with evolution on in 2024. ASTPA is expecting a flattening of that demand in 2024 and then um, is projecting that there will be an upswing again in 2025 as candidates um, we believe will ru be rushing in again prior to the June 30th, 2025 deadline. Um, and as you will recall, recall from other agenda items, that's when the credit relief initiatives and evolution policies um, have some deadlines in incorporated into them. So it will be a roller coaster is what we are uh, anticipating in terms of um, the demand for the CPA exam. So it seems like it will take some time uh, before uh, uh, sort of the, the process flattens out. So you know, just expect that. And uh, that I think was the main takeaway. I would now like to invite Ms. Nancy Corrigan to speak to the various agenda items. And if you would just comment on the specific agenda item when you get to it. To President Salazar, so continuing with uh, 14A1B, uh, which is state board committee that was discussed a little bit yesterday when the appointments were announced the state board committee or SBC is a subcommittee of the board of examiners and serves as the direct link between the board of examiners and the state boards of accountancy so an important function there. I attended my first meeting on October 12th and following are some highlights of that meeting. This committee reminds me of the uh, relations of the uh, member boards committee of NASBA. So this is AICPA and there's a kind of a reciprocal group with NASBA. So it's very, very similar. Um, of course, we discussed as we have been for some time, CPA evolution readiness. Uh, the coordinated effort of NAP, NAP, which is NASBA, AICPA, and Prometric are all working on CPA evolution candidate readiness. Very important and, and indicating that that is all on track. And this is kind of a coordinated effort involving 
academia, candidates, state boards, standard setting uh, boards, review course providers, content development, testing, and release efforts. So the whole ball of wax as it pertains to CPA exam. Um, surveys and all kinds of meetings going on as the course that, you know, January 1st approaches critical deadline. Uh, they have also um, established or are establishing a task force with meetings scheduled to set the exam passing scores. That will be six panels of 90 CPA volunteers. And there is already an interest of 300 and some applications received thus far. So lots of interest in, in doing that, you know, critical function of scoring the exam. Um, as Ms. Salazar mentioned, of course, uh, increased uh, enrollment to take the exam as the new as the year end approaches and people wanting to pass the BEC before approaching those three new disciplines in which they have to choose one. So they'd like to get it all in. However, noting that the exam passing rate is falling as a result of the rush to just get in and get it over. So anyway, best wishes to all of those trying to take it and get it behind them, but it's, it, it's really tough. So uh, AICP has posted a sample spreadsheet and tutorial video. It's available for candidates to gain familiarity in advance of taking the new exam format. So that's a wonderful tool. And of course, Every committee, every board is talking about the Experience, Learn, and Earn program that's on track with Tulane University as the pilot. Some three to 400 firms are showing an interest in that. That's largely uh, smaller and regional firms rather than the big firms showing an interest in, in that. So AICP is definitely promoting STEM recognition, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for accounting to be included, really important. So that's an ongoing discussion. AICP is endorsing a bill to expand the section 529 savings plans, those college savings plans, which would expand the use of those plans to include expenses to obtain and maintain certain post-secondary credentials, including CPA related credentials, very exciting. And discussed research and gathering of facts about education and who graduates, you know, who enrolls, who graduates, and what are they doing with all of that. They're trying to give kids and parents access to what it means to be a CPA. It's very important because there's a point where who really knows what that means? What does it mean to be an accountant? A lot of times parents don't know either to guide them along that way. So I'm gonna move on now into uh, 14B, which is NASBA, National Association of State Boards of Accountancy and various reports there. So being the regional director, Pacific regional director automatically places me on the relations with member boards committee. So we met on October 26th, just prior to the uh, annual meeting or the board meeting and annual meeting. And we discussed the regional calls that were held during August, and I reported that to all of you at our September meeting. So I will go on for that. We also, during that committee meeting, discussed our regional breakout sessions, which some of you attended when we were in New York City. Uh, during the breakout sessions, they were rather mild this time compared to the one in June at the regional. Um, and of course, everybody's anxious to know what's happening with the ELE program. Various jurisdictions are updating their rules and regulations, seeming to understand collectively of the importance of remaining consistency when it comes to the 150 hour rule requirement. Uh, wanting NASA AICPA to, to explore other ways to accomplish, you know, advancing the profession and working with the pipeline. Another big one was outreach events and how the various jurisdictions approach it. And of course, California always seems to hit a home run because, and, and somebody even said, borrow what we have on, our, on, on California's website. These other jurisdictions need to really get out there and do that. Of course, they don't have the 115,000 some odd licensees that we do and potential candidates that we do. But um, outreach is really important. And of course, um, California does hit a home run. So uh, during that time, we had board of directors meetings. So the prior board met on October 27th, pipeline updates, um, a comment that was kind of important is that as candidates will, after January 1st, have to choose from one of the three disciplines, it is thought that this may attract some non-accounting uh, majors 
to the exam and into the possibility of what they might do with a credential such as that. So that's kind of interesting. There are a number of working groups that are analyzing where the profession is losing people and why, very important. NASDAQ's new chair, who starts off now, uh, is assigning a task or established a task force, professional licensure task force, trying to explore new ways for CPA licensure and to how to update the UAA rules for, you know, to modernize and that sort of thing that everybody has to go through at some point. Continuing to monitor the 120 hour versus 150, there are a couple of outlier states that are being aggressive and may violate that, that importance of consistency. And CPA evolution, again, being on time and within budget, same thing AICPA is saying. Um, let's see here. And um, rebranding of the CPA image, very important, uh, starting in high schools and community colleges. The American Accounting Association, they mentioned, is considering a high school division to expose students to the profession. So that would be something really um, important, you know, that they are considering. 21 jurisdictions, I believe Ms. Senator mentioned this yesterday, have, a, have accepted the credit relief initiative. Uh, so you can, you can see what the other jurisdictions are doing. NASA is working on the 20, 2020 to 2023 candidate performance book that was discontinued when CPA evolution really became you know, the big event uh, took center stage for what they needed to focus on. So there's much demand for that. Universities are asking for it. So we will be seeing that hopefully before too long. We talked or talked in committee about the UA uh, changes to peer review standards. Uh, the C CPE standards were updated. Uh, the last time was 2019. So at least every couple of years that will happen. And it was effective January 1st are uh, stressing the importance of content review and qualifications of content reviewers for the CPE courses. So that's being highlighted in the changes, allowable virtual options. We know we have new options as far as our continuing education and additional topics were added to kind of expand the field of study to bring that more current with, with you know, current times. So the going on, the annual meeting was October 30th and 31st, um, presentation on the future of the profession, looking into different forms of business models and organizations to incentivize people, getting them interested in the profession. They noted a real change in the typical triangle where we're used to seeing partners and managers at the top and a whole bunch of staff down here at the bottom. And really uh, the new skill set is showing more kind of in the mid range and fewer at the bottom level with entry level staff, not to scare them away, but to encourage them to go after those skill sets. So kind of a change there. Um, Something interesting in the AICPA presentation at the NASB annual meeting is that image and salary are higher on the list of wants by candidates rather than that perceived 150 hour barrier. They don't see it so much like that. It's really image and salary that drives them more supposedly based on certain surveys. Uh, we had an in-depth presentation on AI, how it works, how ethics remain very important. Data governance at companies is difficult and there are many risks that need to be addressed. So there was a, it was kind of a luncheon presentation that was pretty in depth. On the 31st and November 1st, the new board met, elected uh, officer or new board members and officers and discussed the incoming chair's plans. And I attended a breakfast of board chairs or jurisdiction chairs and NASBA directors and a couple of interesting points. There were two jurisdictions that spoke up. I really can't remember what states they were, but one said in kind of the lower levels, like um, maybe middle schools and that, that they're seeing engineering books in the school library. So some of the different disciplines are starting to gain exposure at lower levels of education. Another one said that there is a children's book in their jurisdiction issued, written by somebody, about accountants or accounting. So little ones are getting exposed by a book such as that. And I thought that was interesting. I'm not sure what that would consist of, but it might be fun. A couple of reminders, there's an executive directors and board staff 
in addition to a legal conference March 25th to 27th, that's in Nashville, Tennessee. The regional meetings are in June 2024. Western, which I'll be involved with, is in Omaha, Nebraska, that's June 25th to 27th. They're saying tentative about these things, but they keep saying those locations and those dates. The Eastern will be Louisville, Kentucky, but I don't have dates for that one. NASA's next annual meeting will be Orlando, Florida. That's October 27th to the 30th. And that's my report. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I would um, add on a little bit to that. I just remind folks that we do have in our printed and online materials agenda, this agenda item 14, B3 is the uh, NASBA 116th annual meeting and it, it contains that itinerary with with the highlights mentioned uh, by Ms. Corrigan, as well as a lot more detail and the, that information, those recordings are made available later by NASBA. So if there is an area of interest, I would also um, echo Ms. Corrigan's mentioning of next year's regional meetings. There is also an orientation for new board members that, that is uh, precedes the uh, regional meeting and uh, is, offered to sort of append it. So the, there's an orientation immediately prior to the regional meeting. So if you are new to the board, um, I would encourage you to um, communicate with uh, our EO and uh, mark your calendars and, and consider uh, the request being input to participate in that next year. It is not too early to be letting the EO know that you would, would be interested for next summer in traveling our travel process takes a while. Um, and so I would also um, like to invite additional comments, if any, from our Vice President, Ms. Chu, who was also able to attend the annual meeting. Thank you to um, Ms. Corrigan's report. I just say, like to say ditto. <laughs> Wonderful. And we don't have any um, uh, communications report. I will, um, I will, will not uh, give a diversity report at this point. I believe that concludes agenda item 14. We will do some public comment, but I just, uh, we, let's do the public comment now. Is there any comment on the assortment of items included under agenda item 14 other business? Okay, seeing none here, I would like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up for online comments on agenda item 14. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, thank you so much. Um, so with that, that concludes agenda item 14. We are going to move into a 15 minute break. And then when we return, we will be um, welcoming Alfonso Alexander uh, in a presentation um, that is agenda item 2D. Um, and that is a, a NASA representative um, speaking about the Center for Public Trust. So with that, uh, a 15 minute break will commence and we will return at 1028. All right, thank you and welcome back. That time just flew. Um, so we are now back from our break 
And we are moving along with agenda item 2D, which is a presentation from Alfonso Alexander, who is the president of the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Center for Public Trust. This item was deferred to today and Alfonso will be joining us remotely. And so I would uh, like to uh, invite him to speak and welcome to our meeting. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Salazar. I hope everyone is doing well and I thank you for the invitation to come and share with you today. Um, I do have a PowerPoint um, presentation that I will will share uh, here. And if you would bear with me one moment to make sure that I can do that properly. Uh, I don't often use uh, this platform. So uh, if you would give me just a second to try to get it pulled up appropriately. Uh, this is the moderator. Um, if you click share and then file, it should let you um, access your um, PowerPoint or you can do um, share and then application and then select PowerPoint. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are you able to see my PowerPoint presentation there in the room? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, what I'd like to do is just kind of give you guys information as it relates to the Center for the Public Trust and uh, then leave opportunity for there to be any questions that I could answer for you. And again, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. For those of you that are not familiar with the NASBA Center for the Public Trust, uh, we reference it as the CPT. And the CPT is, is a, an organization that is a standalone 501c3 nonprofit organization that was actually uh, founded by NASBA, and it is focused on uh, public trust from a standpoint of ethics and values. And what our mission is, is to develop, empower, and promote ethical leaders. And we do that in a variety of ways through the Center for the Public Trust uh, that I'll share with you here through this presentation. Um, the first component that we have is student programming. And in our student programming, it ends up being really the largest portion of what we do. As you can see from this map here, uh, which isn't fully updated, and I'll explain what I mean. Uh, the states that you see in blue are states where we have active student chapters on college campuses across the country. Those that are in gold are ones that are uh, where we have commitments for universities to start a chapter before the end of this academic year. I'm proud to say that uh, California will no longer be uh, gray, as you see there, we, uh, thanks to the support and help from uh, Ms. Corrigan on your board, as well as um, input from Ms. Salazar, we will have at least one university coming on board in California and possibly a couple more uh, as we progress through the rest of this academic year. But uh, definitely, we have a commitment and have already started working with one university in California that I'm proud to say uh, through the efforts of Ms. Corrigan. And then we're also working uh, with the university in Washington as well. The two shapes that you see over to the right um, that may not be very recognizable uh, are Guam and uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. We also have... Uh, chapters in those two um, territories also. So excited about that. The student chapter program, as I mentioned, uh, spans across multiple states. And you can see here the progression that we've had since the organization's inception. We started in 2011 with a couple of universities to pilot and have had steady growth over the years 
uh, and really controlled growth. And today we have 54 student chapters across the country. And that's our primary program for our students. Uh, but then we do have additional organizations and programs as well that I'll share with you here in just a moment. Uh, with our student chapters, we have categories that we've established to incentivize chapters to perform at higher levels. And the golden star is the highest performing chapters. Uh, we have 14 of the 54 that reached the golden star level this past year and two brand new chapters that we brought on uh, in the spring of 2023, Eastern Kentucky University and Jackson State University. So. Uh, we continue to spread and add momentum in various uh, states across the country and excited about that. Uh, you see here we have an initiative to help better diversify not just our organization, but then also how those trends can uh, expand beyond the accounting uh, profession into the accounting profession. And that first initiative is our HBCU initiative. And the DAS, NASBA Diversity Committee partners with us in this effort also. And what you see here is a listing of the universities that we have brought on board as a part of this initiative. I will state that two of them, North Carolina A&T State University and Fisk University, were already involved with us prior to this initiative. But the additional four that you see have come on within the last uh, three years since we've had the initiative going. Our goal is to grow the number of chapters that we have on HBCU campuses uh, to 20. And HBCU stands for Historically Black College or University, if you're not familiar with that term. We also track the number of Hispanic serving institutions that we have. And because of the prevalence that we have in Florida, the relationships that we have in New Mexico, Colorado, and in a couple of the Midwest states, we have uh, eight historic or eight Hispanic serving institutions that we already are working with. And once we get our HBCU numbers up to that same number, then we will begin to focus and work on growing both the Hispanic serving institutions and the HBCUs. Probably our landmark program from a student standpoint is our leadership conference. And I heard earlier Ms. Corrigan and Ms. Salazar referencing the regional and annual meetings uh, for NASBA. At the regional meeting each year, we will host a student leadership conference uh, during one of those regional meetings. And typically that conference will rotate the East one year, the West another year. This past year, it was uh, in conjunction with the Eastern Regional Meeting of NASBA in Kansas City, Missouri. We have 43 students there representing 27 universities, and we fully scholarship students that uh, come and participate in that. Our goal is to bring the leaders that lead our chapters into uh, this particular event, and then they go back and take leadership lessons that they gained from uh, that event back to their respective universities. We also provide um, a certification program in ethical leadership for universities. And we have about 115 universities that in some capacity use this program. This is a six one hour module program that totals six hours and a final exam uh, that teaches ethical decision making, ethical leadership concepts, and shares examples with students. And so this is something that uh, accounting students in particular have embraced across the country. This past year, we had 5,526 students to go through this program. And in fact, um, we know that they that it is being used by some um, firms when they have talent acquisition folks on campus as a differentiator. And we've gotten uh, commitments from uh, students that have said this is one of the things that helped them land their first opportunity in the accounting profession, as well as um, recruiters from firms have shared with us that they look for involvement in all of our programs, but in particular, if someone had gone through the certification program uh, when they're recruiting on college campuses. So proud of that. We also have a fun program where students have an opportunity to 
participate in a national video competition. They have an opportunity to win up to $1,000 in this program. Typically, they would put together a video that focuses on an ethical issue that they've identified and use a video as a medium to share the word. This gives us an ability to, one, make ethics training fun, but then, two, to replicate the work that we're doing. Since we're only touching about 125 or so campuses in total across the country and a limited number of students, students that voluntarily choose to get involved, this program through the uh, way that we do it gives people an opportunity to participate in the viewer's choice portion. And each year we have somewhere between six and 7,000 views of the videos that are a part of that particular competition. So it gives us a, a broader audience to spread the word. We also have professional programs and in our professional programs, we participate in activities where we either partner with other entities or we have these activities ourselves. What you see on your screen now is a listing of the various activities that we have. Um, the because we because ethics do matter is an online training program that we have that's set up for professionals. Uh, what you see in terms of the award uh, certificate down at the bottom is our being a difference award where we give awards out to individuals in the community as well as on college campuses that are truly being a difference in terms of the impact that their leadership is making from an ethical standpoint in their communities or on their campuses. Uh, what you see the word integrity is a conference that we par partner with Baruch College in New York City every year to um, have a conference that's focused on audit integrity. And that conference we've been doing now for 16 years with them uh, every year. And we do several others around the country in partnership with universities or other third party organizations. And then uh, what you see that's labeled internal controls is just an example of a website that we have where we actually provide case studies and other resources to uh, state CPA societies and other entities that are looking for ethics content that they can access to use as part of their work. The training program that I mentioned earlier uh, is three one hour modules for professionals, and it is designed to help them understand ethical culture and how to build an ethical culture, how to be greater ethical leaders, and how to strategically implement ethics uh, components within their firms or organizations. But this, this particular training is also used by states around the country, uh, and I'm proud that you guys had signed up, have signed up to participate with us too as a part of your discipline program. And so just to give you an idea, uh, we now have 19 boards that are participating in that program. Uh, this past year, thus far in 2023, 141 people have been through that program as a part of discipline action from their board of accountancy. And then we have 157 other participants that have gone through that program. And those other participants go through a different version of it that does not have the disciplinary components and they actually will receive a certificate of completion as well after completing all three parts. So thank you for your partnership with us in that regard. We also participate in uh, professional programs with other entities. Uh, these are just a couple of examples of workshops and, and sessions that we've led uh, you can see one of those is the Alabama Association of School Business Officers. Those are controllers and CFOs of school districts in the state of Alabama, and we have a, a healthy partnership with them. Uh, the second photo that you see is IMA. We uh, partner and speak at IMA events on a fairly regular basis, as well as other state societies and other entities around the country. Uh, proud to say that uh, our organization, because it is a standalone organization, we have to make sure that we are fiscally sound. Uh, NASBA does provide financial support to us, but it's only one of our revenue sources. We also fundraise from uh, firms, corporations, individuals, and other entities, as well as have revenue generating activities like our 
uh, certification program for the students that I referenced earlier. And what we're doing is making sure that we continue to exceed our income budget so that we stay in a positive net position. Uh, we're trying to build a reserve so that we can make sure that we're a viable, sustainable nonprofit entity, and we're preparing for upgrades to our technology based program. So the 2 training programs that I referenced just a moment ago. Um, we also look to raise funds and partner with other entities as a part of that revenue development. We have opportunities for organizations to sponsor leaders that are involved in our student chapter programming, like what you see on the screen there. Uh, we do also have where some firms have chosen to sponsor chapters. So chapters that we are partnering with, we have some firms or local organizations that are their official sponsors and that works very well for us also. And then funding goes to different things that we do to help support ethics awareness. We write articles, we uh, promote positive ethical stories in newsletters. We also help provide expert commentary to uh, things when issues arise. Additional things that we do is we have a golf tournament every year to help support the funding of our operations. Also, uh, this is a picture from our most recent golf tournament in 2023 that was in uh, Brentwood, Tennessee, a suburb just south of Nashville. And we have an annual golf event that uh, continues to be a fundraiser for us. And then just a few weeks ago at the NASBA annual meeting, we had a fundraising event called Cuff for Cause. And that Cuff for a Cause uh, event allowed us to um, put in handcuffs several of the NASBA executives, CPT executives and board members, as well as a few other friends. And those individuals uh, raised money to get out of jail or out of the handcuffs, but all of that support went to uh, the Center for the Public Trust in our student programming. And Proud to say, just in that one event, uh, we were fortunate enough to raise over $55,000 and have a lot of fun in the process. And so those things all go toward helping to fund primarily the student programming because our philosophy with the Center for Public Trust is that if we can help to shape the thinking of the students before they enter into the marketplace, then we have a better chance of making sure that the best and most consistent ethical decisions are being made. And that's what our effort goes towards. So just wanna say again, thank you for your partnership with our discipline program. And also thank you for all of the support that many of you guys who've been to our NASBA events have given us individually, as well as collectively, we're always available and happy to work with you guys uh, as a board in any way that we can. So with that, I'll shut down the PowerPoint. And if we have time, uh, Ms. Salazar, I'm happy to entertain any questions that I can, uh, but want to be sensitive to your schedule. Great. Thank you so much for that, Alfonso. Um, do we have any questions for Alfonso from our board members in the room? Ms. Tu? Thank you very much for the presentation. It was very informative. I was wondering, you mentioned some, uh, obviously fundraising is one of your sources, but do you have a fee for service program? Is the ethic leadership training a fee for service? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you for asking that. So the, the professional version of the ethical leadership uh, program is a fee for services. So anyone who has been uh, required by his or her board to take that program uh, pays a fee of $250 um, to take that course. And uh, individuals that take the other version of it, that's just a public uh, educational version, uh, that one is, two, is $200 for them. Uh, and then the student training program uh, that I mentioned, the certification program there is $49 per student. And um, we do have where many universities will uh, cover half of that for their students and they use it as a class project. And then in some cases, um, professors will use it at, just like they would a case that they may bring in and then the students pay uh, an activity fee for it. But those are our two primary fee for service programs. 
Thank you very much for that. Are there additional questions? Okay, we do need to go through on each agenda item our public comment as well. Um, and so uh, asking for public comment here in Sacramento. And seeing none, I'd like to ask if our WebEx moderator can open up for online comments or questions regarding this agenda item. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close the panel. And Alfonso, thank you so much for joining us remotely. We appreciate you sharing all of the great things that CPT is doing. And, um, and uh, we, on behalf of the board, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to see you and look forward to uh, connecting with you again in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for the opportunity and have a great, wonderful holiday next week. Take care. Thank you. All right, well, that moves us along in our agenda item to 15A, which is our enforcement program oversight committee. And that report will be given by the chair, uh, Ms. Yentu. Thank you, President Salazar. We, uh, in our committee, we only have one item. Um, it's discussion and possible action regarding information provided to individuals petitioning for reinstatement of a CPA certified certification or reduction of penalty pursuant of business and professional code section 5115. This item provided members with an opportunity to review and make necessary modification to information provided to individuals who petition for reinstatement of a CPA certification or reduction of penalty. To ensure that CPA members are provided with sufficient information to access a petitioner's request, staff conduct an annual review of the information provided to petitioners, such as the CPA petition form and petition hearing manual. Staff have identified and recommend the following revision to the petition hearing manual. Number one, the deletion of the paragraph, page one, paragraph five, which identified the manual member members received for each CPA meeting, including the dis disciplinary guidelines, the petition hearing manual, and the enforcement handbook. Two, update to the section example of petition hearings webcast on page four to include petition hearings from 2023. Three, the deletion of the section on page five titled best practices for conducting a virtual petition hearing. Staff has also identified several non-substantive grammar and form uh, formatting changes, which is identified in uh, strike out and underlined throughout the document. The changes brought forth in this item do not include, in, include any changes to the pet petition process. The EPOC recommend that CPA approve the edits to the CPA petition hearing manual as provided in the attachment two. This is a fully formed motion and does not require a second. I will now turn to President Salazar for a second and vote. Okay, so thank you for clarifying. It is fully formed. And so we have a first and a second essentially already on the floor and we are ready for the discussion phase about any questions regarding the motion. Okay. All right, seeing no questions from our board members here prior to a vote, we do need to open up for public comment. So I'd like to invite public comment on this agenda item here in Sacramento. 
And seeing no public comment here in Sacramento, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator to open up for public comment for the motion on the floor under items 15A2. This is the moderator, not the direction of the board. I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio-only participants may raise their hand by pressing star 3 on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close. And I'd like to invite Ms. Rebecca Reed to please call for the vote. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Christian Lauda? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Yes. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Evangeline Ward? Yes, the motion carries. Thank you very much for that, and thank you, um, Chair Chu. Moving along, 15B is our Committee on Professional Conduct, so I would like to invite Chair Lata to present. <clears throat> thank you, President Salazar. Okay, getting into our first item up for discussion for the Committee on Professional Conduct meeting. It would be our item 15B2, discussion on the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy Credit Relief Initiative. For that item, staff provided background on the Credit Relief Initiative, or CRI as it's referred to. The purpose of CRI is to restore credits which expired during the COVID-19 pandemic and invite CPA candidates to continue where they left off in the testing process. Staff explained the two options, including the NASBA CRI letter, which is one, whether to grant extensions in MOS, or two, to approve extensions based on individual candidate requests. Staff indicated that option two, extensions based on individual requests is not feasible given the volume of potential requests. The other variable discussed was what specific dates should be used if the CBA does indeed choose to move forward with the CRI. The two date ranges staff presented for consideration were the U.S. national public health emergency dates and the California COVID-19 state of emergency dates. After discussion, a third option was presented, which further extended the end date to implement the CRI and MAS from January 31st, 2020 through December 31st, 2023. The CPC recommends that the CBA extend CPA exam credit that expired from January 30th, 2020 through December 31st, 2023 to June 30th, 2025 due to the COVID-19 pandemic natural disaster. This is a fully formed motion and does not require a second. I will turn it over back to President Salazar for discussion and a vote. Thank you very much for that, Chair Lata. Board member discussion, questions? All right, seeing none, we are ready to move forward for a vote. Um, yes, and we will go with public comment. We do have public comment here in Sacramento. Jason Fox with the California Society of CPAs uh, in support of the, the committee's recommendation. <clears throat> we were a part of the conversation yesterday at the committee level and uh, urged strong support for the relief uh, and, the, and the motion on the table. Thanks. Thank you very much for that public comment. There's no additional public comment here in Sacramento, so I would like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up the online portal for public comment on agenda item 15B2, and that is a motion regarding the credit relief initiative. This is the moderator, and I'm the direction of the board. I'll open up the Q&A feature, feature for public, public comment. Public uh, comment. Uh, members uh, of the members public, of if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon. Located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function and audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. 
I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their request. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close public comment. And uh, with that, I would like to invite Ms. Reed to please call for the vote. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Christian Lada? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. And Patricia Bachelor? Yes. And the motion passes. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite Ms. Lata to continue. Thank you, President Salazar. So the second item we discussed in the CPC meeting was our agenda item 15B3, discussion on pathway for firm owners licensed with general accounting experience to obtain authority to sign a test report. Staff provided the CPC with information on the proposal of a possible pathway for CPA firm owners who are licensed with general accounting experience to gain the experience necessary to convert their license to one with authority to sign reports on a test engagement. Current law restricts firm owners to convert their license to have a test authority because firm owners do not have a supervisor to review the firm owner's work and complete the certificate of a test experience. With the proposed pathway, firm owners would be required to enter into a written agreement with a third party, a test monitor, who will serve the role similar to that of a supervisor to verify the firm owner's experience. In addition, the pathway would require both the firm owner and the attest monitor to appear before the qualifications committee prior to granting a test authority to the firm owner's license. The CPC discussed what the qualifications would be for the third party attest monitors and whether they will be pre-approved. CBA staff confirmed monitors will be required to have a CPA license with attest authority and their firm must have a passing peer review report. CBA staff is currently identifying firm owners who may fall into the category of needing this new pathway as well as firms who might be interested in serving in the role of a third party attest monitor. The CPC advised staff to move forward with gathering further information and bring their findings back to a future CPC meeting. That concludes this agenda item. President Salazar, would you like me to continue? Please. Okay. Moving on to agenda item 15B4, discussion on the National Association of State Board of Accountancies proposed revisions to the Uniform Accountancy Act model rules. Staff provided the CPC with information about NASBA's proposed revisions to the Uniform Accountancy Act's model rules exposure draft that relates to peer review. The proposed model rules would establish a list of required documentation and information that must be submitted to a board, as well as set guidelines of when the documentation is to be submitted. This documentation will be accessible to state boards via a secure website. Staff drafted a comment letter supporting the proposed revisions with a suggestion to modify the language to make it more evergreen, which would reduce the need to change state regulations if future information becomes available via the secure website. The CPC recommends that the CBA authorize the CBA president to work with staff to finalize and submit the draft comment letter in attachment four in support of the intent of the NASBA proposed revisions. This is a fully formed motion and does not require a second. I will turn it back to President Salazar for discussion and a vote. Thank you, Chair Lata. Board member comments, questions? All right. Seeing none, uh, I would like to open this up for public comment here in Sacramento. And seeing no public comment here in Sacramento, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator, please open up the online portal for public comment on agenda item 15B4. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests.
All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close. All right, with that, Ms. Reed, please call for the vote. Tony Lim? Yes. Christian Lada? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Yes. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. And Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. And the motion passes. All right, thank you very much. And that concludes Ms. Lada's report, Ms. Corrigan. We take public comment on 15B3. I, I was wondering if anyone would notice that. I kind of left it open for public comment, but we can certainly go back and just reopen 15B for public comment just to make sure everybody um, was able to be addressed and uh, inviting public comment here in Sacramento on 15B in general, specifically B3. And seeing none, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up public comment on 15B3. This is the moderator, not the direction of the board. I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function and audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. All right, moving along to item number 16, that brings us to the very exciting officer elections. And so, uh, as you may be aware, each year our Board of Accountancy does elect a CBA president, vice president, and secretary slash treasurer. The elections are held in a specified order, and we begin with the secretary treasurer position, then vice president, and then president. Attached in our documents are three statements of qualifications from CBA members, and we have Christian Lotta, CPA, who is seeking to serve as the CBA secretary treasurer. We have Yen Chu, seeking to serve as CBA vice president. And we have Joseph Rosenbaum, CPA, seeking to serve as the CBA president. So prior to a leadership position vote, members that have not previously submitted a statement of qualifications will absolutely have an opportunity to express interest in the position. And at that point in time, all candidates will be given up to five minutes of floor time to describe why they are qualified for and interested in the position. Once all candidates are identified for a given position and they have been provided the opportunity to address this body, a vote will be taken for each candidate. The vote will start in alphabetical order by the candidate's last name. And the first nominee to receive a majority vote will win the officer position. So um, the, then, of course, the newly elected um, officers will assume their respective offices at the conclusion of this meeting and will serve a one year term. So at this point in time, uh, Ms. Christian Lotta CPA has submitted a statement of qualification for the secretary treasurer position. And I would like to open the floor to see if any additional CBA members would like to serve in this position. Candidates will be given five minutes of floor time to describe why they are qualified. So calling for interest and seeing no interest. Um, I, we now have one candidate, Ms. Lotta. So I would like to call for a motion um, for Ms. Lotta to serve as the secretary treasurer. Okay, Ms. Tu. So move and also, Oh, never mind. I was going to see if, for interest of time, if we check to see if there's no other candidate we can vote for the slate. But we we have an order, and in the past it's just been one to proceed okay. step by step. Absolutely. 
I would like to make a motion to nominate Ms. Lata for Secretary Sec uh, Treasurer. Thank you so much. We are looking for a second. Ms. Ward? Second the motion. Fantastic. Board discussion? Oh, um, I'm sorry. Ms. Lata, would you like to make a statement in addition to your uh, written qualifications? Thank you, President Salazar. Um, I'm honored to have the opportunity to submit my name for nomination for this position. I don't think I need to say anything addition, additionally as already in my statement, but yeah, proud to serve the board. Thank you so much. Um, additional comments? Public comment in Sacramento? We do need public comment on this. Of course we do. Yes, we do. And I would like to invite our WebEx moderator <laughs> to open uh, for uh, online comment regarding motion on the floor. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access these features and submit their requests. All right, and seeing none, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close that. All right, with that, we are ready to move on for a vote. So, Ms. Reed. Joseph Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Yes. Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Christian Lotta? Yes. And Tony Lynn? Yes. And the motion passes. Thank you very much and congratulations. So moving along at this time, Yen Chu has submitted a statement of qualifications for the vice president position. So I would like to open up the floor uh, to see if any additional members would like to serve in the position of vice president. Okay. Seeing none, um, all candidates are afforded up to five minutes to comment. Ms. Chu, would you like to make any comments before we call for a motion? Thank you, President Salazar. Uh, my statement is already in uh, the docket, so just like Ms. Lata, I would be very happy to serve. Thank you so much for that. Um, I am looking for a motion for Ms. Chu for the position of Vice President. <coughs> Ms. Ward? I would like to make a motion to um, appoint Vice, I'm sorry, to, to appoint Yin Chu for the position of Vice President. Thank you. I am looking for a second. Ms. Lata? I second that motion. Thank you so much. We have a fully formed motion on the floor. Board comments, questions? Seeing none, I'd like to invite public comment here in Sacramento. And seeing no public comment, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up the online portal for public comment regarding the um, motion on the floor for Ms. Chu for Vice President. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. All right, and it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close the panel for public comment. I'd like to invite Ms. Reed to please call for the vote. Christian Lotta? Yes. Tony Lynn? Yes. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Ian Tu? Yes. Evangeline Ward? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Yes. And Nancy Corrigan? Yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much and congratulations. All right, moving along at this time, we have Joseph Rosenbaum, CPA, who has submitted a statement of qualifications for the position of president. I would now like to open the floor uh, to board members, see if any additional members would like to serve in the position of president. And seeing none, all candidates are afforded five minutes of comment. Mr. Rosenbaum, would you like to say a few words? 
I have no further comment, but I thank you all for your support. Thank you very much. I'm now looking for a motion for Mr. Rosenbaum for the position of president. To make the motion to nominate Mr. Rosenbaum for the position of president. Thank you. Ms. Corrigan. I will second. Fantastic. We do have a first and we have a second. So I'd like to invite board member comments or questions. I would now like to open, seeing none, I would now like to open for public comment in Sacramento. And seeing no public comment in Sacramento, I'd like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up the online portal for our public comment regarding uh, the motion on the floor for Mr. Joseph Rosenbaum, CPA, uh, for the position of president of the Board of Accountancy. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function and audio only participants may raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. All right, and seeing no requests for public comment, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, moderator, please close. Ms. Reed, would you please call for the vote? Nancy Corrigan? Yes. Christian Lada? Yes. Tony Lim? Yes. Patricia Batchelor? Yes. Joe Rosenbaum? Yes. Katrina Salazar? Yes. Teresa Thompson? Yes. Yen Tu? Yes. And Evangeline Ward? Yes. And the motion passes. Congratulations, Mr. Rosenbaum. I would like to just pause for a moment, ask our, our slate of officers for next year to please stand so we may appreciate our thanks for your leadership. Congratulations, this is very exciting. All right, that concludes our officer elections. And we now move on to closing business. Um, item agenda 17A are agenda items for future California Board of Accountancy meetings. So I would like to start with our board members and see if there are additional items for future agendas for staff and leadership consideration. Future agenda items? I, I know. Yeah. I know. Yes. Yes. I, Ms. Thompson. <laughs> so this might be a little rambly because I'm not entirely sure how to phrase this idea. Um, but it would be, I'd like to put up for consideration the um, idea or the um, highlighting the fact that students and firms may consider alternative work to earn arrangements to help fulfill the 150 credit requirement um, in order to be able to sit for the CPA exam. Um, there are examples that we can refer to in other jurisdictions that seem to be working well. And I think in order to continue to grow the pipeline for our California candidates, we may want to highlight this mechanism in state for our schools and our firms to consider. Okay, Ms. Tu. And to piggyback on Ms. Thompson's um, um, addition to uh, new business, if staff can kind of bring back in, in future dates um, other models that are used in other jurisdictions and kind of um, let us know are there different options that we might be able to model ourselves? Uh, or is there a, a existing uh, program already in California? So, so let me attempt to maybe synthesize this. So we have an ask for an educational item at a future board meeting to educate and inform how our board functions and specifically the ways in which we can accommodate some uh, different, um, oh dear, now I've lost the word, some, some different uh, pathways for 
candidates to meet their hours. So that would be exploring how internships work, what credits, MAC programs, the different ways that we in the board experience have seen um, applicants successfully complete their 150 hours. So more just an educational topic, is that correct? I think so, yeah, like highlighting and maybe making more visible the options um, that candidates can consider in the state. Candidates and firms. Candidates and firms. Okay. Um, okay. And so that is just a very blanket educational item that is noted by staff to consider how that might potentially be brought back at a future agenda item. And does that, I think that encapsulates both pieces? Okay. Um, are there additional agenda items for future consideration? Okay. Ms. Lata? Thank you, President Salazar. I just wanted to make sure in the item just discussed that universities' education with them is also included with the firms and the students. Yes, it, it would be the 150 hours, but thank you for that clarification. Okay. All right. So seeing no additional comments, Ms. Joffrey? Since Mr. Knotes will be on the future agenda, I just wanted to say it was my honor and privilege to serve this board. Thank you. And we thank you for your service. It's, um, it is uh, it's sad to transition. And so we are both wrapping up our service at the same time. <laughs> um, all right, so we do require public comment. Um, I would like to invite public comment here in Sacramento and we do have some. Jason Fox of the California Society of CPAs. <clears throat> We'd be supportive of the conversation Ms. Thompson and Ms. Tu uh, raised. But my, my comments are related to, I just want to uh, uh, thank uh, President Salazar for her year of service. Um, it's been a very eventful year. There's a lot of significant conversations. I think you've steered the board um, well through those and been very thoughtful and including stakeholder. Uh, and looking forward to Mr. Rosenbaum, Ms. Tu, and Ms. Lada in the, in the next year for leadership. So thank you, Ms. Salazar. Glad you're going to be still on the board, but thank you for your leadership. It, it has been, I will take the liberty to say it has been my pleasure to serve the board. It has been a really fascinating year. The staff has been outstanding. Every single staff mem member has exceeded my expectations. So I would like to thank the staff and my board member, and we have new board members here, and you have joined an amazing board at an incredible time where you are going to be able to help um, steer the path of our profession in a positive manner. And I'm so excited for the future of, of what this board will be achieving. So um, we do have, so thank you. Um, I do want to say uh, we have some additional work still to do uh, with our meeting. I've just set my stuff down uh, in terms of our agenda. Uh, we are moving out of closed session. Oh yes, oh I'm sorry, I did not finish public comments. I got too excited. Um, I would like to invite our WebEx moderator to please open up for online comments on the final um, item, which is 17A. This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click the Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen or use the raise hand function. And audio only participants can raise their hand by pressing star three on their device. And I do have a request um, for comment in the Q&A. However, they said that it's not related to the current agenda item. Would you still like to um, hear the comment? Um, we can, uh, this is legal, we can entertain the comment. And if we would like, we could reopen that item or um, set it for uh, the future agenda to continue the discussion. Okay. In that case, um, I have a request for a comment from Tyler. Mm -hmm. And Tyler, you'll be given five minutes to speak and a 30 second warning. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Hi, can you guys hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. I, I was I was listening briefly, and I'm sorry if I missed it, but I, I, I was wondering if it got approved for that credit relief initiative for any uh, credits that expired between January 2020 um, through December 2023. If there was any more information I can get on that. All right. Um, oh, thank you for uh, calling in and asking that question, Tyler. Yes, the agenda item was handled and a motion was uh, was passed regarding that credit relief initiative and there will be more information available. You can listen to the webcast recording and follow um, the, the web page for announcements going forward. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Um, moderator, are there any additional comments? This is the moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A uh, panel? Yes, moderator, thank you so very much today. All right, so this brings us all the way through our open item sessions. We will now be moving into closed session. We will be dealing with closed session items seven and eight pursuant to government code 11126E to discuss closed session for advice from legal counsel on litigation, as well as um, convening into closed session to deliberate on enforcement matters. So that is what we will do. Once closed session is completed, the CBA meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much for joining us and have a wonderful holiday season. <laughs>